Thank you for all coming to today's webinar. Paul Wheaton is speaking on permaculture. I'm Mike Taylor and um, I have to apologize up front. We had technical issues and I lost the first half of the recording when a recorder failed. And we're going to pick up in the middle of the question and answer period. My apologies, one and all. Um. And then there was the question about the sun trap pond. It's like if you're going to build a really big pond, then you can have you can start talking about a sun trap pond. But if you build something small, the problem with a small sun trap pond is that that sun just keeps moving throughout the day. <laughs> Hell, it moves all year long. The summer it's up, and then the winter it's down low, and and it's like uh, it just won't hold still. So so you kind of get your sun trap made and you put your little reflecting pond in front of it and it's like oh the reflecting pond actually gives us the extra heat into our sun trap like a couple of weeks out of the year and that's it. Um, so eh, now Sepp Holzer, the uh, you know the, the, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer and, and, and as we're talking about Jeff Lawton being the crown prince and Bill Mollison being the king then Sepp Holzer is the Dalai Lama of permaculture. Um, so what he likes to do is when he builds a pond, he likes to build it crazy deep. Just 20, 25, 30 feet deep and big. So he can get all that reflection-y stuff for all the seasons, you know, like all of the cold seasons, all winter, spring and fall, he's getting lots of reflection off of that, including morning and afternoon. Um, and at the same time, because it's so, so deep, the top of the pond won't freeze. Because what happens is, is that when the water at the top of the pond gets cold, then it, it's, it sinks. And when it's like, let's say it's 30 feet deep, then that water that's down there next to the bottom, so, so deep, that water is like 50 degrees. And since it's warmer, then it goes up to the top. So what happens is, is that the water at the top of this pond is like 50 degrees. And it's kind of warming everything around the pond. Ta-da! Did I answer the question completely? Pretty much. <laughs> there was one follow-up in there. Um, since it's wet, he was wondering about uh, if he can just start with mulch or whether he's going to need netting to prevent erosion when he's starting. Um, I don't. I, mulch is definitely helps with almost everything. Um, netting sounds like something you're going to buy, and so usually I would try to avoid that. But mulch is always good. Yeah, we actually were required to put down a jute mesh on a, a hillside here, and um, it didn't do anything other than <laughs> other than get in the way and trip you. But somebody made money selling you that jute mesh, so it was worthwhile yeah. to have you have it required. You have you be required to use it, right? Yeah, because that way they got more money. Because somebody did. Yeah, so it, it worked out for them. <laughs> okay. Um, questions seem to have slowed down here. Um, when uh, I, Aileen uh, says that uh, building uh, uh, a pond on an existing stream may be illegal if you or interfering with the flow of fish and water and stuff in navigable waterways. Oh, yeah, um, that's a huge topic right there. Mm -hmm. The department uh, making you sad is watching you. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, yeah, I, I've seen some, I mean, don't be building any kind of pond anywhere where you might be messing with fish habitat. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, are you going to put in, like, a fish ladder? You know, probably not. And, um, boy, I've heard of some people building ponds where it's like this is a, there's fish in this creek, 
And um, wow, the department making you sad can get mighty upset. So, so this is where you get into that thing of like, okay, hey there, uh, <laughs> you need to take out that dam, and uh, we're going to fine you ten thousand dollars a day until you've taken it out. And you have to take it out slowly so that you don't cause any floods. <laughs> well, it depends on a variety of factors, but but the bottom line is is like yeah, if you've got an existing creek. I mean, if you've got a creek where there's no fish in it whatsoever, or if it's a seasonal creek, then um, uh, my understanding is is that if you go out and you build that pond, then um, uh, there's a couple of weird little things that go with it. But but one is is that if the dam is eight feet tall or less, and the size of the pond is less than a quarter of an acre. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> One of my favorites. Okay. And and on top of that, um, uh, the answer there's going to be a question that's going to be asked of you if if it's going to be time for the forgiveness thing. The question the, the question that might be asked is is what do you use the pond for? Now, the key to know is that when answering this question, if you derive any benefit, you have to take it out. So the answer is, I don't know what was wrong with me. I was on a lark one day and I had a traco. Uh, I just thought I'd see if I could build a pond. I don't know what I'm going to do with it now. That's acceptable. <laughs> then oh. you get to keep it. But oh, if it's no. like, I keep fish in it. Oh, got to go. I use it to put out forest fires. Oh, it's got to go. I use it to irrigate. Oh, got to go. I use it because it's pretty to look at. Nope, gotta go. <laughs> okay. I'm stupid. Oh, you can keep that. <laughs> that's cool. Being stupid, that's cool. We're all for that. Yeah, I I have to agree with you there. I've I've seen evidence of that. Um, Morgan um, asked one last question here about uh, this guy in New York again. Uh, about crows, they're huge. She's thinking about installing bird boxes to attract natural predators, and you'd rather not fence them or anything. Any suggestions on that? Well, I mean, are the are the crows causing them problems? Are they just like you know creeping them out from horror movies he's seen in the past? I don't know, <laughs> Morgan. No. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to respond to that. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> So I, I don't know. Um, yes, he I'm, says. I'm having a hard time. I mean, any time where I've seen, like, big flocks of birds, just crazy numbers of the exact same species of birds, just way out of balance. Like, that's that's making me think of Alfred Hitchcock's movies, you know? Mm -hmm. In those cases, every single time, it's like some sort of farm country monocrop disaster. Um, but whenever I've seen a place where it's like got massive diversity of what's going on, I don't see those those insane flocks of all the same species. So, yeah. um, well, we have riots of crows out here. Well, there'll be a couple of hundred of them collect in the eucalyptus trees, and it is definitely freaky. But Morgan says they're evil and they eat all of his tomatoes. This is his main concern. Okay. Um, I uh, uh, I think that there are a variety of different solutions, um, and and uh, um, I don't know. One is to plant more tomatoes, I suppose, but another one is is that I think that um, uh, I think there's going to be lists and lists of solutions here. One is is to have a dog that thinks chasing crows is fun. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that can be amazingly effective. Um, <clears throat> As far as predators for crows, I don't really know of any. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a problem here. Is uh, we've got hawks and the the crows and the hawks don't seem to bother each other at all. I kind of wonder what's keeping the crows around. So if you've got a whole bunch of crows around your house right now, and and they're kind of freaking you out, what are they eating? What's their food? 
Is that I mean, for me or Morgan? Are scavengers. <laughs> They're scavengers, right? I mean, what is what is it that's like so plentiful that they, you know, there's so much to eat? Well, we um, have we have long valleys of agriculture land out here, and uh, they they move from place to place. They stop in and visit the high schools with the seagulls at lunchtime, and um, there's just a lot of them. Okay. So. Well, I mean, their their job is to kind of clean up stuff, and and so you know, dead animals, um, rotten fruit. Um, I mean, they're the cleaning crew, so it's kind of like what kind of what kind of messes are there, and it and um, I'm I don't know. I I guess I guess. Cause I I know of places where it's like the problems they're having is that they're not getting any of their own fruit and it's the same sort of thing where it's but that's that's birds that are eating the fruit but they're not crows um boy i don't i don't have a good answer for crows okay <laughs> julie says she loves her crows <laughs> they're territorial and scare the hawks off that want to eat her chickens so there's something good in in each side of the coin I, oh, and I, Morgan I, says I she can have ours. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people find crows to be a spiritual animal and would embrace them. So, I mean, it's kind of a Native American thing, the, the raven, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. We would have a good view of our gardens, and actually I don't see the <clears throat> crows being much of a an issue here. I, I actually welcome all of the birds into the gardens. They eat a lot more. Uh, insects and they do uh, plants it seems so, so I, 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 I can't help but think that wherever the crows are too many that I would like to look around and see if systems are too artificial like if there's monocrop or or too many streets too many buildings too many like like things are too far away from what would be natural. Mm -hmm. But I'm not there, so I can't really see it and, and point and be all whiny. Look over there! It's not right! Yeah. Well, I don't know... I don't know what to say here on that. Um... Okay, uh, we have a, a thought here from Morgan is asking, um, any thought on inoculating uh, HBs, I assume this, hugoculture beds with oyster mushrooms to m mitigate heavy metal toxicity, big issue with chemtrails here? Oh, um... So now, I understand, from what little I know about chemtrails, it's some sort of um, al aluminum oxide. Um, and so I've, I think that the key is that if you're going to use oyster mushrooms to remove heavy metals, then the key, the, the most important thing is, is that you need to be able to um, take the mushrooms off the land. So when the fruiting body shows, you need to clip those out and haul them away. That's how you're going to reduce the heavy metals in in your beds. Okay. You can't just, I mean, it's not like it's like, and now they're gone because mushrooms grew there. It's like, no, no, they're still there. They're, they're just, just in the mushrooms, yeah. <laughs> well, these mushrooms are pretty good at breaking down a lot of toxins, like things that are made out at a molecular level. And, but there's some things that funguses can't break down, like persistent herbicides. Funguses don't really break those down at all. Um, hence the word persistent. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then, of course, elements like heavy metals can't break those down either. But what they can do is take them up, and, and they will. A lot of uh, oyster mushrooms are pretty good at taking in a lot of toxins, and they effectively end up inside the mushroom. But then, um, you know, the thing is, okay, now you've pulled all that heavy metal stuff 
out of the soil and it looks like a perfectly delicious mushroom. Don't eat that! So if, if you feel like your soils are, have, are loaded with heavy metals, then, then um, microremediation is a great way to go, but you've got to take those mushrooms and haul off. There's also some plants that will take that stuff up, but I'm, I'm not very savvy in those species. Okay. I think one of them is watercress. Like watercress will take up a lot of toxic gick. Okay, Maureen says how to dispose of them into the landfill. Landfill. I mean, I. It's I already contaminated. <laughs> well, I mean, landfills today are supposed to have a rubber lining. <clears throat> so, I think I think that the thing to do is like they did in the Edo period. Um, you know, you, you try to get to the point where it's like the amount of stuff you're taking to the landfill is almost zero. And and so like um, you know let's let's try and right you know let's embrace that we're still going to do that, but let's just try and reduce it, you know, half by by half, and then later half again, and later half again, and later half again. So let's let's just try and get it reduced down to very very little that's going to the landfill. Good idea. Uh, thoughts on comfrey? It's green. <laughs> comfrey is something that, like, um, when when permaculturalists grow fruit trees, um, you start to think, like, okay, what's all the stuff I'm going to grow under the fruit tree so my fruit tree will be extra, extra happy? And uh, because grass tends to make fruit trees sad. And comfrey is, like, the go-to plant. Comfrey is a perfect fit for growing under a fruit tree. Not only does it discourage grass, but it, it also accumulates. It, it has a deep taproot that will go down and accumulate a lot of the things that fruit trees like best. So all plants do better growing in a polyculture than in a monocrop. And so um, you know, we, we start looking at all the different possible things to plant under a fruit tree. Comfrey is I universally at the top of the list. And it's an excellent medicinal too. Uh, edible, medicinal, um, some, there are some people that complain about, oh, it contains dangerous alkaloids. And what they leave out is that comfrey, a cup of comfrey tea contains one one hundredth of the dangerous alkaloids that you can find in a bottle of beer. But when you're going out and you're, you're going to go buy that beer, how many people are there saying, don't drink that because it's got the dangerous alkaloids? <laughs> it, it turns out it totally has them, but it's at such a small quantity that it's like uh, nobody's really worried about it. Yeah, well, we've used it for a cell division stimulant that really does earn the uh, term bone nip. Uh, we found out that it, one of the things in there will regenerate cells three times faster than not treating it with a comfrey poultice. <laughs> it's pretty good stuff. I've, yeah, there's, there's lists and lists of reports from people having all sorts of happiness with a, a comfrey poultice. Uh, a lot of farmers grow, or you know, by farmers I'm thinking more like homesteaders, will grow lots of comfrey and then they'll um, trim it and throw it in for the animals because they really enjoy eating it. Uh, some people uh, will use it to grow uh, like a compost tea, um, which, um, you know, they'll get a big barrel of water and they'll put a bunch of comfrey leaves in it. And, um, and then when it gets to be a couple of days old, it smells like shit, which is, I guess, the smell you want when you want something that's basically a manure tea. Mm -hmm. So it smells exactly like that. And uh, so loaded with nitrogen, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a tea. I, I think when they do that, when they make those teas like that, um, A, I kind of feel like my general rule of farming is if, if it smells bad, you're doing it wrong, and that smells bad. <laughs> um, so, so there's that. Plus, that looks to me like work. And I'm lazier than that. So this whole thing of like, I'm going to go and trim up my, cut down a bunch of comfrey and put it in a big barrel and fill it with water, and let it get all festery, stinky-like, 
Then I'm going to filter that out, put it into this other container where I'm going to go walk around and water everything. All those steps. Sounds like a lot of work to me. I'm, I'm far too lazy for that. So chop and drop is the way. <laughs> yeah, chop and drop, or, or like uh, what's even lazier than chop and drop is it's like, turns out I don't mind that grass growing there so much. <laughs> My lawn chair here, I'm sitting there, and it's like, well, it's pumping out a lot of food. Maybe, maybe eventually that apple tree will outcompete that grassy stuff there. And the other things will outcompete the grassy stuff, maybe in time. I'll I'll use the fourth dimension to my advantage. Okay. I'll you know it's like it's like go stuff that's outcompeting the grass. Go. I'll wait here and see how that turns out. <laughs> um, take another little turn here. Uh, off kilter acres once would like to hear your thoughts on tick control over and above chickens. Um, a lot of people will get those um, uh, guinea fowl. They love to eat ticks. Of course, they're kind of noisy. Um, but there's the whole thing about eating the ticks. I, I think a big thing is is that, um, uh, once again, um, I, I Systems that seem to be rich permaculture systems, I don't think have a lot of ticks. You know how it is, like, you'll be out in the country, and it's like, if you go over 20 miles that way, they just don't have any ticks. There just aren't any. But if you go 20 miles that way, you got to be careful, because you'll come back infested in ticks. So I think it's worth kind of thinking about what's the difference between these two systems. I mean, this is a big part of permaculture, observation. Mm -hmm. Why is it that over there everything's infested with ticks, while over here there's hardly any ticks at all? <laughs> worth looking into. But, I, but when it comes to like, make you like you've got a bad tick problem right now, yeah, the guinea fowl. That seems, from everything I've ever heard, that's, that's the way to fly. For keeping them off of uh, your pets and out of your house, um, I, I've, a lot of people will dust their animals with diatomaceous earth. And so then um, uh, diatomaceous earth is edible by us. It's perfectly fine you know, on your skin all day or in an animal's fur all day. And when it gets onto a tick, it... Um, scrapes off their waxy outer coating, and uh, then they turn into little tick jerky on the inside of that tick shell. Yep. <laughs> and, and they're all sad and, and stuff. And dead. Yeah, so then, then they don't seem to bug your animals so much. Um, let's see here. Uh, I have another question on people doing uh, water projects, gray water aquaponics and stuff, and using PVC pipe. Do um, you have any uh, issues with uh, PVC? I, it's a plastic, so I have an issue with it. And, and it's one of those things where it's kind of like, um, you know, it, we, if you're going to have plumbing, what are you going to use? Uh, there, there is stainless steel uh, uh, for, for different kinds of plumbing stuff, um, and of course copper. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I look a lot to the stainless steel stuff. I think the galvanized stuff has a problem too. Um, <clears throat> so I'd, I'd have to say that that's an area where I'm observing and trying to learn more myself. When it comes to aquaponics. Aquaponics, uh, we, we've got a lot of people in the permaculture world that think aquaponics is awesome. Myself, I'm not a fan of aquaponics. I far prefer aquaculture. So um, aquaponics is going to be where you have tanks and pumps and, and plumbing and you're moving water around and you've got fish in your system and plants in your system. And, um, but it's, a, it's an artificial environment. And so right there, it's like, yeah, I, I would rather have a natural environment. And um, so, which is why I live rurally instead of urbanly. Because when you're in an urban environment, it's kind of like, I want to raise my own fish. And it's kind of like, well, you're going to have to have a big old fish tank. 
and and that's when they do the aquaponics. Whereas when you're out in the country, it's like I want to have fish. I build some ponds, and and now I can have a natural environment. Okay. Um, we have uh, a question here. What are your thoughts about Sepp Holzer's poisonous plants to get rid of worms and animals? I think that um, <clears throat> Sepp Holzer is a brilliant genius, and, and it's actually that thing that I use as an example of like uh, how uh, a lot of the things, when you get advanced enough, when you're going far enough down the permaculture road, some of the things sound really crazy to others, um, and and so it takes a while. You, you've got to get when when you get far enough down the road, it, it doesn't sound so crazy. You kind of get used to like there's going to be a good reason there, but um, like if you were to go in and say to a weed board, uh, I want to plant lots of poisonous plants in my pastures, then then the people in the weed board would would freak out. Um, in fact, the word a noxious weed, which is, it's you know, it's illegal to grow noxious weeds. Um, then, it, what, it, what that word started off to mean? I mean, now the word means the government is against it, but originally it was supposed to mean these are plants that are poisonous to animals. The funny thing being is that nearly every plant is poisonous to animals in, you know, the right quantities. And some of the things that we buy as feed are actually, you know, like for example, alfalfa is bought and and fed to animals, uh, fed to ruminants, but it causes bloat, and so it's kind of like, um, you know, it's it's technically a noxious weed, but people grow it and bale it and sell it as animal feed. What Sepp Holzer does is he plants lots of poisonous plants, but of course there's also lots of non-poisonous plants. And then the animal is, is um, driven on what they want to eat based on instinct. Their instinct is like a hundred times stronger than our instinct. So if I held a, a, a leg of a roadkill up to your nose, your instinct would tell you to not put that in your mouth. You would smell it and go, I've got putting that in my mouth. But I could also bake uh, chocolate chip cookies, and the smell would say, I want to put that in my mouth. And so animals have that instinct much stronger than we do. So what happens is if they wander out into a field, and like let's say it's a cow grazing, and it's like, mmm, grass, mmm, alfalfa, mmm, clovers, mmm, all these things, mmm, dandelion. And they're going out there, and they're eating all this stuff, but there's some poisonous plants out there, and the cow is just not interested in eating that. It's like the cow can smell it and say, no thank you, I won't eat that. Now, we go a few days into the future, and the cow is feeling a bit poorly, uh, a little bit of a stomach ache. Uh, uh. But now that plant over there that, that smelled so damn nasty a few days ago, today smells kind of good. I think I'd like a little nibble of that. And the cow eats a little bit. This is how animals self-medicate. So, so basically, all those poisonous plants are the medicine cabinet for the animals. I mean, have you ever thought about how is it that we need to feed medicine to all cattle, all pigs, all chickens? In the meantime, all these birds are just flying around in the sky and nobody's giving them any medication whatsoever, and they seem to still be alive. How rude is that? <laughs> Don't they know that we're supposed to medicate them? Shouldn't they be on some sort of pills or something? You mean, this is a toxic environment. They can get sick. And those deer over there, what are they doing jumping over that fence? Shouldn't they be on some sort of medication? I mean, how long is it going to be until there's going to be some sort of government program to chase down all the deer and give them shots? <laughs> so it's it's like no, this is this is we put an animal into a fenced area, and we don't move them, so they wipe out all the greenery in the area. Then the only food we give them is hay. They don't get to pick their food. 
we, we dictate what food they get to have. And then when they're feeling poorly, they don't have a medicine cabinet to turn to. Instead, they've got us. Well, I think they might have bloat. Let's give them some anti-bloat goo. And so it's kind of like, uh, this is how we do it. We, 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 we have to diagnose what's wrong with them, and then we give them some sort of medication for that. And then if it goes on long enough and we haven't figured it out yet, then they might die. And the animal suffers. It's, it's kind of like we, we've taken them away from nature. And it's wrong. Does this answer your question? Uh, I think that probably will. Julie makes a remark here that she likes the instinct theory of goats, but her first goats had the instinct and didn't eat too much azaleas. Her next goats almost all killed themselves, and they go back for more. Uh, should she just let them kill themselves because they lack instinct? <laughs> is, there, is there a solution to that? Okay, I, I'm going to say that, that A, that doesn't happen very often, and B, I think that, I mean, let's, let's think about how Darwin does this stuff, right? So Darwin's going to say, oh, hell yes, get rid of those goats. I mean, did those, were those goats, did they go through a breeding program of survival of the fittest and the healthiest and the strongest, or were they just put through a, a breeding program where breed as many goats as you possibly can without any regard for what's, um, you know, best for the quality of the breed. Or the breeding that was done was done based upon a, a certain artificial appearance of the goat or an artificial like how much milk does that goat produce or an artificial how big does the goat get because it's a meat breed of goat. So I'm going to say, yeah, I think that uh, if, if goats, if you've got some goats, that when put into an area of toxic plants, they don't self-medicate, but instead they self-poison. Hell, maybe they're just uh, depressed goats. <laughs> now she says she's going to do better picking goats next time. <laughs> I I think it's uh, a good thing to um, let the let the goats self-select out, and and the, I I I suspect that that's a minority. That there's hardly any goats. But then again, you know, goats are a smart animal and a dumb animal at the same time. Um, and uh, I, yeah, goats. Yeah. The other thing is, is that how many, how many? I wonder. I mean, aren't goats from like the Middle East? Aren't we taking them out of their natural habitat and bringing them to an unnatural habitat? Because like I know that like um, when I raised goats, one of the issues was selenium that it turns out that there's areas of the United States where there is zero selenium in the, in the soils. There's just utterly none. And where goats came from, there was plenty of selenium. And without it, when the goats go and they, they browse in, on the foods that grow here, that uh, they have all kinds of problems due to this lack of selenium. Oh, well, maybe that's why they're attracted to it. Perhaps it has some of that missing I thinking, material. I was thinking more along the lines of like they don't they they haven't encountered this plant before. They they didn't go through hundreds of generations of like the ones that liked that died hundred generations ago, and therefore you now end up with a series of goats that have lived that don't like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, the questions are still rolling by here. Uh, back to Sep for a minute. Uh, have you tried using Sep's bone sauce for other things and protecting your trees? I um, I was without land until just recently, and so uh, just in the last few weeks, I picked up 225 acres. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, I have this little jar of bone sauce that Sep made. I have not yet put it on anything. <clears throat> now, out of the forums at permies.com, we've had a lot of people go out and create their own bone sauce and report back that they're having great success with it. And of course, you know, Sep himself talks about his great success with bone sauce. 
Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, we have one here. How about dealing with mosquitoes in a wetland situated within some forest behind my house? It extends beyond my property, so I can't touch all of it. Should I just grow basil and plants that push them away? And that's asked by Amir. I think <clears throat> that um, there's a multifaceted approach. Um, one is is that wherever you have places that seem to be fostering a lot of mosquitoes, I would want to introduce species that like to eat lots of mosquitoes. Um, and again, it kind of comes back to this space of like when you've got lots of diversity, we don't seem, I mean, places where there's lots and lots of different things growing, there doesn't seem to be a lot of mosquito problem. Um, but the next thing is, is that I would then be thinking about like bat houses and um, swallows and uh, any other thing that like loves to consume mosquitoes. Um, that would be my focus. I mean, when you've got, um, if it was something like a little pond or a, a popular thing is, is like uh, if you've got mosquitoes breeding in the horse trough, throw a goldfish in there. The goldfish will eat up all the mosquito larvae and now there's no more mosquitoes coming out of there. Yeah, um, our, our, we actually the have uh, the people out here will come around and give you mosquito fish. So what they call them, they throw them in the pond. Two days later, mosquitoes are gone. Yeah, so that's a that's a pretty popular way to fly. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, uh, I I prefer getting the. Uh, I think bats are really great for that. Okay. Uh, question here: um, Do you prune your fruit trees? Uh, Sep doesn't, but many per permaculture folks do. What's your feeling? I am a big fan of both uh, Sep Holzer and, and Masanobu Fukuoka not pruning. And um, at the same time, Sep writes extensively about not pruning, but if you ask his son, Yosef, he'll say, well, you'll notice that everybody on the farm has a pair of pruners on their hip. <laughs> and so if you see something really bad, like um, when you see two branches in a tree touching each other, that's a vector for funguses. And they'll, they'll prune out one of the branches there. Um, and sometimes when you see a crotch forming, you might prune that out. Um, but they won't do the kind of pruning that's typically done with fruit trees. Um, uh, I mean, that's just a lot of work. Um, but the other thing that they do is that they definitely do not shoot for a lollipop-shaped trees, which is which is the most common thing that people do with fruit trees. <laughs> okay, so you're you're cool with pruning for uh, structural deformities, but but not pruning for shape. I think that the best thing to do is to do nothing at all. But once in a while, you can kind of see something that's like going wonky, and and will eventually like destroy the tree. And it's like, all right. I'll step in and do a little something to prevent that. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Do you have any thoughts on air potatoes? I don't even know what an air potato is. I was hoping you did. <laughs> no, I've never heard of an air potato. Morgan, can you tell us what an air potato is, please? <laughs> And then I'll make up something to say about it. <laughs> it floats. It's a potato that floats in the air. <laughs> yeah, but it's high in upsidasium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a vining tuber. I, oh. So apparently it's it's uh, some specialized tuber. I'm I'm not. It's probably from South America because those guys down in South America they love their tubers. So, uh, like a common alternative tuber uh, is mashua, where um, you know it it has the little tuber that's not a potato but potato esque, and um, and at the same time the leaves are are edible. Okay, he says it's uh, found in Florida and South America and Africa. 
Okay. So I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that one. Sounds like not Montana. That would explain <laughs> why I seem to be so ignorant on the topic. Yeah. I have an excuse. What's your excuse? <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're running out of questions here. I'm going to put in a last call. Um, if you have any more questions for Paul here, let's get them in and uh, see what what we can get. Uh, but I don't think you're looking at the comments in here, Paul. We've had a, a number of people thank you for uh, a very entertaining and informative uh webinar today. I think I'd have to learn how to turn the comments on. Um, okay, next time we'll, we'll put the comments on for you. The, I can show you those. but um, If I do, I'll, I'll lose the screen here. So, uh, let's see. Any responses here for our last call? Um, let's see, a, uh, Cal asks, um, what are your thoughts on using mycelium with Google Culture? Do you do that? Yes, I'm for it. I, um, <clears throat> I've gotten some in the past. I mean, of course, it's going to show up on its own. You just provide an environment for it. It's already everywhere. Um, but you can also, if if you're interested, you know, buy a little bit to work into your stuff. And yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do with Hugo Culture is to create a good fungal soil, and mm -hmm. um, with with the good funguses. And and but you'll get that whether you add mycelium or not. I I uh, I prefer to not buy things if I can get away with it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it, uh, it's always good to have like one spot on your land of really good soil. And if you don't have that spot, maybe you want to kind of get started on it. So like some people are like, I have a hundred acres. I'm going to go out and build eight miles of hugel culture. Um, I, I think what's a better idea is to go out and build like um, several hundred feet of hugel culture the first year and get that going good and then the next year make a couple hundred more feet of hugel culture and then you're going to dig some gobs out of the first hugel culture bed and kind of stick those gobs into the new hugel culture bed and that's going to be loaded with your mycelium that's that's so good so it'll so, be like little seeds of dirt Okay, so you're just culturing your own and, and inoculating your fresh stuff with uh, some of the old inoculant. Okay, good. There you go. Um, uh, we've got a question here. Is when's Wood Stove 2.0 DVD coming out? That's a great question. I uh, have spent a great portion of the last two days looking over um, what was going to be the final version, but we found a couple of glitches. And we're going to get a couple of glitches ironed out. And I think that tomorrow or the day after, they're going to go out to get um, hundreds of copies burned and mailed out. So just days away at this point. All right. Uh, Kim's asking, is there anything that should not be planted in a hugo culture bed? Wow. That's a great question. How about how about pond plants? <laughs> um, oh, I'm trying to think of like what would be like not a bit. I mean, basically, the cool thing with a hula culture bed is that like at the top is where you kind of plant your plants that are cool with things being dry, and at the bottom are the plants that like things kind of soggy. And I'm trying to think like. It would be something that would not like Hugo culture. But you know, I'm I'm not thinking of it. I mean, it's going to be a fungal soil. What's something that doesn't tolerate a fungal soil? Well, I'm I'm wondering if you know fruit trees and things like that would be what she's thinking about. You could. I mean, um, I could see that there would be a problem if you put it 
fruit tree at the tippy top of a hookah culture bed, and then all the fruit's 20 feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it's so far away. Then, then um, that would be less than optimal. But when you plant a fruit tree correctly, then a fruit tree is going to have a lot of branches very low and very near the ground as opposed to the pruning technique of making the lollipop tree. So I think it's I think you're going to be able to get a lot of fruit where you can reach it. Um, I, so yeah, the harvest. Plus the other thing is, is I like how Fukuoka talks about when you stand next to a tree, the stuff that's up to three feet is for the animals that graze around the tree. The stuff from three feet to eight feet is for people, and the stuff that's all above eight feet is for um, animal feed when it drops. Mm -hmm. And so um, I I think that that's a brilliant way of doing it for a tree. But I'm maybe I, I can't I can't think of uh, something that I would not want to put in a hookah culture bed. Maybe um, your folks can can throw some ideas out. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, yeah, back to the um, inoculating your your new Hugo culture bed with your old ones. Uh, Cal is asking uh, how long, or, or do you know how fast it would show up in the soil? How long does it take to, like to grow or, or bloom or whatever? Yeah, it's really fast. I, I know that I had uh, something where I had a whole bunch of straw, and I put in um, some mycelium, and it seems like two weeks later you could just find these ropes of white mycelium everywhere. So it goes pretty quick. I imagine, you know what, um, uh, s some fungus is going to be faster than others. Now, would that be influenced by the, the roots that are growing down in that area, helping to uh, propagate the mycorrhizal bacteria and fungus? Well, um, mycorrhiza is going to have a symbiotic relationship with roots, typically. Um, uh, and so, but when you're just getting started and you've got a new bed, the roots of the stuff growing there is generally not very significant in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the answer to your question is kinda. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So Kim's uh, response to what you could or couldn't grow grow in there it sounds like it's fair game to do whatever I want. Yes, Kim, I think that is what he said. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, except for killing people, don't don't like kill people. Put them into your hugo culture beds. I'm pretty sure there's a law against that. Yeah, and the bones don't break down as quick as you'd like. <laughs> That's because they're so well preserved with all that tickling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you a story sometime about two-year-old uh, hostess products. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> that do not de decay. It's like how can something be food two years old and still be well, edible? <sighs> you know, uh, in in defense of the Twinkie, uh, consider for a moment that honey. They found honey that was like three thousand years old and it was still edible. Yeah. You know, so just because it lasts a long time doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Um, I think that the, the, the thing that we should be focusing on with the Twinkie is that it's a toxic shitstorm. That, <laughs> that seems like that would be the point that it's like, ooh, this bothers me. I, you know, it's, it's made of chemical foam. Uh, um, doesn't, you know, maybe we should be concerned about that. Spun lard and sugar? I mean, what could well, go now, wrong? <laughs> Who organic knew? Organic lard, organic lard, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that organic lard is a health food. I think I think that our meats and um, have gotten a bad rap because we put these animals out on toxic pastures, and then the toxins concentrate in their fat cells. 
And then we say, oh no, eating red meat is carcinogenic. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, but it's not the meat itself, nor is it the fat. It's the toxins that were stored in the fat that are carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. Very, very possible. No, it's, it's, it's very, it's true. I, I'm going to argue that that's, it's not just a possible, it's a fact -a I'll argue it. Well, okay, I'm, I'm not much of a red meat eater, <laughs> and I prefer free-range stuff when I can. But um, the, uh, the one thing I was told one time that it's probably healthier to eat stuff with lard in it than it is with palm oil, which is true uh what you find in everything else in the you know when we, we start talking about diet and what's good for you and all that space <clears throat> there is there is that guy out there that i he, he approached it from the total opposite direction and it's so amazing because he he, he got one of those think -a meters hooked up where you think big thoughts and the meter goes whoa 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 and then you watch television and it goes and so then he, he stuck all those little sensors all over his head and then he tried different foods and went through his work day and he what he was trying to do is like to find out what food could he eat that would raise his IQ and he would be even better at his job um, and along the way he ended up losing like a hundred pounds and um, and he found out that the food that was the very best for um, for everything, for his general overall health, for higher IQ and losing weight was grass-fed organic tallow. Oh my. <laughs> this, is, this is beef fat. Beef fat. The thing that we were told years ago caused cancer. Huh. Okay. <laughs> so well, that's I, very I mean, different. <laughs> I mean, I think that if you go into Whole Foods or some organic grocery store, that I believe, and this is before I heard that, I believe that the most nutritious, healthiest thing that you could possibly buy in the store was grass-fed beef. And the reason why I thought that is that that's the only thing in the store that is derived from a polyculture. Everything else is a monocrop. Organic carrots, a monocrop. Organic corn, monocrop. Everything in the vegetable department came from a monocrop. And so I just kind of feel like even if it's labeled organic, it's still coming from a monocrop. But the, but the beef, the, the pastured beef, is coming from a polyculture. Those, those animals, as they go out and they graze those fields, they're finding 50 different species of plants that they can nibble on. And therefore, I believe that that, that is the foundation of true nutrition, is the polyculture. Now, I'm all for people wanting to be a vegan. That's great. And, and I, just, I just wish for those people to get their food from a polyculture source. And this is one of those places where you can have so much more in your garden than you can from the grocery store or from the farmer's market. You can grow your food in a polyculture. Yeah, and there's nothing like going out and picking something off of a tree and eating it before it knows it's dead. I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think, I think that there are things that are in those foods that we consume moments after harvesting them that we have not been able to hold a ruler up to yet that are very good for us. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, it's, it starts to die as soon as you pick it. Um, got a, Amir wants to know your feelings on free range chicken eggs. The word free range um, is turned out to be really kind of sad and pathetic. Um, and so it's, it's, in the last year there's been a lot of work on like coming up with new words to replace free range because it's been so 
just like there's you know there's all these factory chickens that are labeled free range. Mm -hmm. um, so free range means so many different things. So it's 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 difficult for me to even get started on talking about it. Um, <clears throat> well, let's let's for chickens let's... that are actually pe that are that are because now we get into I've written this massive article. Uh, most of the hate mail that I get has to do with my article on chickens, on raising chickens. And I, I'm a firm believer in paddock shift systems. A chicken is a jungle animal. And if you're going to raise chickens in Montana, you must provide the jungle. And um, these things, where they've got these big factory sheds where chickens wander around in their own shit all day, but they've got a little yard that they can wander out in, and they don't. That is, is could be labeled as free range, but the you know I don't think of it as free range. I don't think it's right. There are permaculture people who think the chicken tractor is wonderful and awesome, and I think that the chicken tractor is not that much different than raising chickens in a factory. And I you know I don't like seeing the chickens that caged, and you know what inside that cage. There's no forest. There's no jungle in that cage. I don't like it. I, I, I believe I want chickens to have fresh greens, fresh forest, fresh jungle. And, you know, if you're going to put an animal in the cage, I believe you're taking on some responsibility to provide it with a better life. Okay. So sorry you pushed a button. I, I went off. But I'm back now. No, Amir says, thank you. Very good point. Very good point. And I think that that's probably one of those words that has been subverted by um, the commercial interests like organic. It's like... You know, here, here's a tip. I mean, I think a lot of your listeners are probably not raising chickens, but they are eating eggs. When you go buy eggs and it says... That the, that the chickens were fed a vegetarian diet, please do not buy those eggs. Chickens are not vegetarians. Chickens are omnivores. Half their diet is bugs. Anybody who is restricting a chicken's diet like that, they're torturing the chicken for the sake of some sort of marketing. This is, I think, I think if you go and you buy beef, and it's like they were fed a strictly vegetarian diet, that is good. Because cattle are vegetarians. They're herbivores. But pigs and chickens are not vegetarians. They're omnivores. And, and when you put down a buffet, let them choose. Let them decide whether they're vegetarians or not. Don't force them. All right. It's all right. Another another weirdness. I'm back. <laughs> okay, I'm 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 calming down. I'll, I'll try to be nicer. I'll try to, to vent less. Uh, what's a lovely topic? You got a, you got any more? Are we about done? I you know I I think we're uh, we're pretty much done. With it. These questions have quieted down. Um, we've got lots of thank yous. Uh, uh, thanks for answering his questions, says Cal. Uh, hopes there will be more chance to listen to you in the future. Uh, lots of people are, are, are happy to have got a chance to meet you today, Paul. And I, it looks like we're uh, one, running down wonderful webinar. Thank you very much, Tristan. I know Paul and so I both appreciate got... that. 255 podcasts that are available out at uh, permies.com or richsoil.com, so uh, where I wax on on all kinds of different wacky topics. But um, I have to say that I uh, this is the first time I've ever done a webinar, and I I thought that it was um, I, I like the idea of how you can record something with a lot of images, and maybe what would be good is that I should. Um, Dig out my uh, my presentations and push them through the webinar engine. You know, I've got a few presentations. 
That actually would be a wonderful thing to do. As I, we talked about having, you know, if you have a slide deck and a presentation, this is a perfect medium for doing that. It's actually better for people that are watching at home than they are trying to read it off of the screen in a in a auditorium. And you have it forever. So, yes, let's let's do some more. Um, Oh, this is one last question. Uh, no, we've got uh, great ideas, and somebody mentioning rich soil, so we're going to uh, send out the link to uh, rich soil to everybody that's in the chat box. If you're not one of Paul's subscribers already, you can go and um, get in on uh, this. Here is a subscription oh, that's, that's link. A my my dailyish email. Um, that is my most favorite thing. And of course, you no. Know, naturally, I I really enjoy people who participate correctly in our forums because that's moving everything forward. But um, whenever I have something to say, I gotta say that, boy, my my dailyish email is my most favorite thing in the world. And and sometimes if I have um, like um, a huckleberry pie to give away, I'll tell my dailyish email people only. You know, and it's like uh, okay, first person to come and do this gets to have the pie. <laughs> so there's seems like about once a month we come up with something that we do just for the people on the dailyish email. But that's that's where I kind of feel like I feel like I have superpowers because of my my dailyish email list and. And there's a checkbox on there too for like uh, help Paul with his uh, devious plots on world domination. Mm -hmm. and I call those people my plots cateers. <laughs> and and so um, uh, once or twice a month I'll send something out and ask my plots plots cateers to to help me with something. And I don't know, it just just feels great to have a minion army, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so I can so when it when the time comes that I need to do something, I need an army. I've got an army at my disposal. It just feels so awesome. Everybody should have an army. It's great. <laughs> okay, well, a couple of your uh, the soldiers here have got in for one last question. Uh, both of them are on the rocket heater, the DVD. Uh, the question is, um, will it be available for sale to people who miss the Kickstarter? It will be definitely be available for sale and and so a um, couple of couple of things one it won't be available for sale until after I'm pretty sure that everybody has gotten the stuff in the Kickstarter I I really I I love the Kickstarter idea I, I just really thoroughly enjoy that machine of and and then all the people who said yeah, I trust you, Paul. Here's a hundred dollars. I'll wait three months until the DVDs are ready. I'm sorry, I gotta give those guys their their candy before I give people candy that are like, well, I'll trust you. I'll give you a hundred dollars, and I'll trust that I'll be seeing it in like a week. <laughs> I I just uh, um, and we're gonna do some other Kickstarters here really soon. I've got two other projects in the hopper and I've been putting in a lot of time in the last week on one of them so hopefully in a week or, and I'll announce it on the daily-ish email so I hope everybody signed up for that but yeah and, and then the other thing is is that all I've asked is that as we're going around and getting all that all, all the stuff set up to be able to sell the DVDs um, you know after the Kickstarter is that I uh, I want the price to be higher after the Kickstarter, so we're going to try and sell it for probably the exact same price, but now you got to pay for the shipping and handling, which um, in the Kickstarter we were throwing that in, you know, kind of with the price kind of a thing. Um, okay. So um, it will be slightly higher, but not much. Um, and uh, uh, but I've now seen all four DVDs. We um, just, you know, like I said, just recently we did the final review um, 
And uh, before anybody gets their hopes up too high, originally when we recorded it, the idea was that um, we we're just recording a workshop. And we thought that there'd be like 20 people that would want these DVDs. And then we did the Kickstarter. Um, and then in the end, it was like 500. And it seems like every day, maybe twice a day, I'm getting emails from people that are like, when can I buy it? I didn't get in, get in on the Kickstarter. And it's kind of like, oh my, this is, this is going to be a popular item, I think. <laughs> so I hope no one's got their hopes up too terribly high on like, this Hollywood presentation. Um, it's it's definitely like uh, some doofus with a camera at a workshop. And, <laughs> and fortunately, we've got Bart, who's a master at at editing and making things fun, who has gone through this and just made it wonderful. And then Ernie and Eric and I got together and we we added a bunch of video commentary stuff for parts where it's like, uh, maybe we could explain that a little bit better. And so um, we've, we've added a bunch of that in. So it's got some frosting in it because the numbers are so high and the number of people who want it. Um, and another thing is, is that in the video, in the videos, we show the shippable core, the rocket mass heater shippable core. And this is an enormous part. And we've got a thread out at Permies where we're talking about who wants to be in the shippable core business, which is a weird question to ask because a lot of people are kind of like, what the hell is that? Um, and it's like only the people who came to the workshop know about it because they saw it. Uh, so we've got to get the videos out so people can know what the hell we're even talking about. Um, but Ernie and Erica were going to do the shippable core business, and then they kind of came to the conclusion of like, you know what? We're more like writers, teachers, um, and research and development, not, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing, distribution, factory kind of folks. And so they're hoping to develop a relationship with somebody to, like, be the shippable core people. In fact, they're kind of looking for several somebodies because it's like the, the shipping on it, can, you know, can be expensive. And so it's like, let's... Let's have several places where there can be, and I and I also like the idea of seeing several different possible designs, like several different variations. So somebody might say, "Well, I'm over in New York, but the stuff coming out of California, I like that better than the stuff that I can get in New York, and I'm willing to pay the extra shipping." You know, so um, I think the shippable core thing is going to be huge. Um, but uh, now I've, I've rambled on a bit, but uh, of course I've been spending huge amounts of time every week the last few weeks uh, going over these videos and, and talking about them, so it's fresh in my mind. Soon! They'll be out soon! <laughs> okay, great. All right, well, uh, I think we're going to... Uh let it go here. The The questions have stopped coming in. We're almost at two hours. And uh, when we put this uh, replay up, we'll uh, have links to um, all of the references that Paul has given and see if we can get uh, links to the various books. And, um, and I hope everybody uh, comes in and and enjoys permies.com and all of the good stuff that's in there. Thanks, Mike. It was fun. Well, good. Uh, I would like to do this again, Paul, and, and we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we can do a, like a regular uh, schedule of going through your presentations that you can put out to a lot of people and, and instead of just a few in a room at a time. That would be great. Sounds cool to me. Okay. Well, with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for coming on and spending your time with us today, Paul. It's been great fun, and uh, I've got some really good comments out here. I know a lot of people have enjoyed it, and um, uh, 
having people in here now saying they're going to be happy to share it with their gardening friends as soon as we get it out. So um, until then, I, I think we're about done. So uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you, and thanks for everybody for coming today. It was a really good time, and we'll talk to you again soon.